Live from the TV30 studio, here is Jim Schneider. Well, hi and welcome to In Focus. This is our final In Focus program of the season, and we just want to thank you for tuning in every week at the same time to keep you informed on critical issues. Well, friends, this month of May 2024 marks 40 years of parental control in education. You know, many take home education for granted here in the state of Wisconsin, that it's always been, but that's not the case. There are many battles that were fought, even jail time that was suffered as a result of wanting to home educate children here in the state. But that all changed with Assembly Bill 887 that was uh, uh, introduced and on May 10th of 1984 was passed, May 18th of 1984 when it was uh, published into law. Tonight is a special In Focus program as we're going to learn about this fight for the parental control of education. With us in studio, we have Randy Melcher with us. Uh, Randy is the founder of the Christian Home Educators of Wisconsin, also is administrator of the Academy of Excellence and AOE Online. He's a board member here for VCY. Randy, good to have you here. Thank you, Jim, for having me on. Uh, indeed. Randy, uh, what we take for granted here in the state of Wisconsin as far as education, many fought for. That is so true. In fact, it's Amazing to believe that in 1920, private education in the state of Oregon was banned. There was a statewide referendum to ban all forms, parochial schools, even private military academies. And this was even before modern homeschooling. By the time we get to the idea of uh, homeschooling, which was starting to come about in the 70s and 80s, there was only a system that was called of a uh, home-based instruction, and it was really designed if you had a broken arm and you were going to be home for six weeks, that you would have permission from your school district or maybe from the state if you were in a special situation, that your parents could be able to educate you at home. Well, over the 70s and 80s, uh, especially through the work of people like uh, James Dobson and people who had brought this issue that parents had the ability to homeschool their kids, all of a sudden the state of Wisconsin stopped responding to applications for people who wanted a home instruction program. Parents felt that they had a constitutional and a biblical moral duty mm -hmm. to train their children and they were willing to face jail time for it. And uh, some very tough consequences, but we have freedoms today we take for granted, but indeed there are those early warriors and early pioneers in all of this. Uh, we're going to be showing some video coverage tonight of the recent Christian Home Educators of Wisconsin Conference, uh, CHU uh, for short. And at this conference, there were some awards that uh, presented, the Bold as a Lion Awards. Yes, uh, our first Bold as a Lion Award we actually presented to Jelaine Appling. And uh, sadly enough, she was firebombed about a month after we presented her the award. We try to find people who are Christian heroes, who have stood up, as Proverbs 2031 says, that the righteous are as bold as a mm -hmm. lion. And so we were able to find two of the people who were significantly involved in the freedoms that we enjoy today in Wisconsin. So right now we're going to take you to that conference in April of 2024 to watch the presentation of these awards. Many today take Christian home education for granted. You know, we're thankful for the many previously unimaginable methods that are available to parents, but this was not always so. As you've read in your conference books, maybe you've seen some of the banners, this year is the 40th anniversary of when Wisconsin put into law the parental control of education. We say parental control of education. The battle was not just over just homeschooling. Just 40 years ago, teaching your children at home was effectively illegal. Sending your children even to a church-run school could have been illegal. They, this was a time where things were going to change. But brave men and women, stood up to exercise their God-given responsibility to train up their children. In 1980, Timothy and Kathy White were Christians who decided to pull their son out of public school. For their decision to homeschool their son, they were charged with truancy and taken to court. Friends and fellow church members questioned their decision. They were facing fines and even jail time. They lost in circuit court. But this was not a preference for them. This was a conviction, and so they appealed the ruling. They lost in the appellate court. They made their final appeal to the Supreme Court of Wisconsin. Their court case was combined with another case, Wisconsin versus Poppins. Another family decided to homeschool their children. On April 26, 1983, the Wisconsin Supreme Court 
ruled in favor of the Poppinses and Timothy and Kathy White and against the state of Wisconsin. The legislature was told to fix this problem. There must be now a definition of, of what is a private school. But what? Would it involve licensure of teachers? Would teachers at private schools have to be licensed? Mandatory accreditation? Prior approval by the state of Wisconsin? And what would happen to the parents who simply wanted to be left alone to educate their children at home? Would they be subject to these regulations? Into that fight walked the young principal of a small church day school, a man named Marv Munyon. Marv traveled the state talking to parents, pastors, anyone who would listen about the opportunity and the responsibility of churches to control their, their church schools free of government interference, about the right and responsibility of parents to control the education of their children free of government constraint. Thousands would pack a hearing at the Capitol and the bill proposed to define what a private school was. My grandfather was one of those people who testified at that hearing. To learn the whole story about what happened, you can join Marv Munyon tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. for his workshop. What happened to a bill called AB 887 and how Wisconsin's private and homeschool law came about? But for now, it's our privilege to honor those who fought 40 years ago for the freedoms that we enjoy today. From time to time, we present uh, an award we call the, the Bold as a Lion Award to those Wisconsinites who have stood with courage for our Christian values against a hostile world. Our first award recipient was Jelaine Appling, and just a few weeks after we gave her an award, her office was firebombed for her defense of the unborn. We trust, though, that today's recipients can enjoy their awards in peace. Timothy White is with the Lord now, but we'd like to invite his wife, Kathy White, to come up to our platform to accept the Bold as a Lion Award for their family. for facing jail time to educate their children as God directed them, for pursuing their cause until the unjust system was struck down by the Supreme Court of the state of Wisconsin. To Timothy and Kathy White, Proverbs 28.1 says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Thank you. On May 10th, 1984, Assembly Bill 887 became Wisconsin Act 512 when it was signed into law by Governor Tony Earle. Standing behind Governor Earle was the young man who had worked with Senator Rochelle to rewrite the proposed bill into the private and homeschool law that still stands today. In fact, in the picture, you see the pen that the governor gave to Senator Rochelle. The Senator Rochelle then gave that pen to the young man standing behind the governor, and we actually have that pen with us today. And we'd like to invite that man to come to the stage to accept the Bold as a Lion Award, Marv Munyon, for your work in protecting parental control of education. Proverbs 28.1, the righteous flee when no man pursues, or the wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. It's such a blessing to be here tonight and to see all of the, you people and all of the students. And I feel like I'm clipping coupons off of the investment I made 40 years ago in this state when I see all these young people being taught at home. So Lord bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, Randy. You were just watching these award presentations given the Bold as a Lion Award to recipients at the Wisconsin Christian Home Educators of Wisconsin Conference. And uh, what a joy it was uh, to see these recipients, Randy. Randy Melcher with us here on the program. Uh, I, I spoke with Marv Munyon after he received this award, and he was just taken aback. He wanted to go to tears because of seeing all these people in the room uh, that were now home educating their children being the recipients of the hard work that he did in 1984. That is so true. I mean, what Marv did, and he's going to tell about it in the next segment here that we have, but he stood at an important place in history, 
education could have gone many different ways. I, I think of like a pinball machine where the little paddles, the ball can go many different directions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Marv stood firm to say, no, we are not going to have government intrusion into parental control of education. There is very few things as fundamental as the right of parents to control right. their kids' upbringing. And, and Marv stood there. And that also brings, begs the question, whose children are they? And, and we see some states are very oppressive as it relates to their education laws and who controls those children. We've heard from uh, administrations, even the present administration, you know, these children are our children. Uh, and, and that really boils down to that question, whose children are they? There was a recent governor debate, and one of the candidates for governor said that I don't think parents should be telling teachers what they should teach. This goes back to the whole issue, again, of whose children are they? Mm -hmm. And from a biblical worldview, we see that God created these children, entrusted them to parents, stewarded them, yeah. and then parents will have to give account to God for how they raised his children. Well, at the CHU conference, Marv Money had a special workshop that took place. So what was his purpose of the workshop? Well, part of it is many families didn't understand the whole history of it. In fact, uh, many are some of the, the COVID schoolers, as they're called, where in the recent years they realized, wait a minute, things have changed so much, mm -hmm. I need to do something. But where do we take these freedoms from? Where did we receive them from? Are these just always been around? And so we invited Marv to share the history. How did this bill, how did the freedoms that we have in statute, preserved in statute for us, where did they come from? Well, this year, May of 2024, marks 40 years of this uh, really parental freedom of education here uh, for the upbringing of their children in education. And Marv recounted that at the CHU conference in April of 2024. Let's watch right now the presentation that Marv made and informing parents how this battle all came about into fruition. Well, I think my sundial says it's time I'm supposed to start, so I better start. I just want to thank everybody for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Marvin Munyon, Marv for short. I usually tell them, if I say Marv, they call me Mark, so I usually say Marv Munyon, but and go by Marv. And I have a box that's 20 inches long that I have every piece of literature that I got during this battle for the to write the law. And so... Uh, I always put a disclaimer when I get up to speak. Uh, I'm here to tell you the truth to the best of my ability, but this happened 40 years ago, and I might be a little bit off on some date, but uh, that's uh, what I'm here about to tell you. And if you can show me anything that I say that isn't true, I'll be glad to apologize and change it immediately because I've always... I'm always interested in the truth. I was married to my first wife for 61 plus years, and she passed away of Alzheimer's. And then I was the loneliest guy in the world. And I began to go back on the speaking trail because I had closed down my organization and to take care of her. And uh, then Chris and I met each other, and I hadn't seen her in 31 years. She worked for me in my office in Madison for five years. And so Chris and I, Chris, stand up. This is my wife, Chris. And Lord willing, we're going to celebrate our second anniversary in June. So I tell everybody we're nearly dead, but we're newly wed. So... <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. I stood up last night when they called me up on the, and I looked at that sea of people and I almost burst out crying. I had no idea that I had impacted that many people. And that's only a fraction of the people that are teaching their children at home in Wisconsin. And, uh, I've also heard that if you're more than 25 miles from home and wearing a tie, you're an expert. And I studied that up, and an X is a has-been, and a spurt is a drip under pressure, and I don't want to be either one, so I'm not an expert. But I do know what I believe, and I do know why I believe it, and I'm not afraid to articulate it. So thank you for being here today. And uh, I'd just like to have a show of hands. How many of you here 
were homeschooled and now you're homeschooling your children. Is there any? Oh, all right. See, we're multiplying fast. That's great. But there's not a group of people anywhere in the world that I would more like to speak to than home educators. And I didn't call them home schools. I called them home-based private educational programs. So every time you hear me say homeschooling, I mean home-based private educational program, but it's easier to say homeschooling. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. But I want to tell you a little bit about that and tell you how this came about, and it was a battle. Let's have a quick word of prayer, and then I'll get going. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here today. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done in the state of Wisconsin. And I thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you've given me to be part of that. And I pray that everything that is said and done in here today would bring glory and honor to you, in whose name we pray and we ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, it all started back in 1983, April 26th. The Wisconsin Supreme Court handed down a decision, and uh, Mrs. White, is that, I did get your name right? Her and her husband had pulled their kids out of school, and they were under the gun also. But uh, Mark Popans had taken two of his daughters out of the public school in Avoca, Wisconsin, and was teaching them at home. And he was part of the Freethinker Church, and he, was, he had the Freethinker School. And uh, the court ruled that the definition of a private school was impermissibly vague, was their word. And it should be so written so that anybody of average intelligence read it would know what a, what a private school was. Well, and that sounds real easy to come up with a with a definition until you start working on it and you get all the people that are there. But uh, anyway, that's how it started. And Bert Grover and I had a lot of dis lot of talks. I was the Christian school administrator at Calvary Baptist Cr uh, School, Christian school in Watertown at that time. And I had gone down to the cap or to Madison and I had met with Dr. Grover and I had introduced myself to him. And I told him, I said, if there's anything going on with private schools, I want to be involved. And little did I know what that meant, and little did he know what it meant either at that time. But he told me in that conversation, he said, well, you know, all children belong to the state. Man, I'm telling you. I knew right then we were arch enemies. And I told him, I said, no, they don't belong to the state. I said, and if you want to be technical about it, they don't belong to parents either, but they belong to God Almighty, and he has given them to parents to bring up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so it was very plain that we were on opposite ends of the spectrum, and, and uh, then the Wisconsin Association of Christian Schools appointed me as their legislative director, and then this this court case came up, and Dr. Grover told me on more than one occasion how ignorant Lawrence Popans was. And I told him, I said, let me tell you, I've talked to him several times, and he's not ignorant at all. I said, anybody that can go through the Wisconsin Supreme Court and represent himself and come out with a victory win, I said, he's a person to be looked up to, not looked down at. So uh, I became very good friends with him and uh, worked with him on the bill. And I talked to him several times and asked him, I said, would this have been, if this bill would have been law, would you have been protected? And he said, yes, I think I would have. And so he was a, a mentor to me. And, uh, but my goal was then, and it still is, to give parents an alternative to government schools. We don't have public schools anymore, anywhere. We have government indoctrination centers. They're not because the public has no input to what's going on today. So, and then COVID-19 hit and everybody went berserk. And uh, 
I haven't had my shots, any of them, but I'm perfectly good. Uh, I said, they'll have to hog tie me and tie me down. And I said, then I'll fight to the end. I said, I'll probably break their needles. But I, I refuse to do that. And so the, an ad hoc committee was put together because the chairman of the education committee said he thought it would be better for education interests to write a, a definition of private school than for the legislature to try to do that. So they put together an ad hoc committee and there were 18 members of that committee and I was one of those. And uh, I soon found myself out in left field by myself most of the time. But they had many different public school groups they had the Wisconsin Education Association Council, that's WEAC, the Teachers Union, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, the Wisconsin Federation of Teachers, the Parent Teacher Association, the Wisconsin Association of School District Administrators, Milwaukee School District, and the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, of course. And there were very few of us on the Christian side of things, but... Uh, there was the Association of Non-Public Schools, the Wisconsin Catholic Conference, and the Wisconsin Association of Christian Schools, which I was part of and representing. Those were on the other side. And it was the desire of the ad hoc committee that we would come up with some kind of a bill that everybody could support, and that's what they wanted. And we began to meet, and there were, we met, and we had a number of meetings. Uh, we started getting information and we started putting things on paper. You know, it sounds easy to define what a private school is until you try to do it. But then you get all this information and you start filtering it and you think, oh my goodness. And then there were ads in the paper started up and people were calling me and they wanted to be represented. And I told them that we were only supposed to work on the definition of a private school. That's what the ad hoc committee was supposed to do. And I tried to get a separate category for Christian schools, Christian private schools, because I thought, how in the world can a committee that's predominantly public school write a definition for a Christian school? And uh, I became very concerned about that. And then... In the process, I got word that there was the Catholic diocese were meeting in Madison. And so I called them and I asked them if I could come and make a presentation to their group. And they said I could. And so I went over there with fear and trembling. But I knew that the Catholics were pro-family, pro-life. And so I posed a question to them. And there was a gentleman there, and he was smoking a pipe. And I don't know what he was smoking in that pipe, but boy, I could hardly, I was coughing and gagging <laughs> trying to talk to him. But he would, he would go, <sighs> and I said, what are you going to do in your schools if they tell you that you have to teach abortion is just a form of birth control? And then he started going, <sighs> And he said, we need to listen to this young man. And I thought, well, you need to get your glasses changed if you think I'm a young man. I was a little younger than 40 years ago. But uh, anyway, he said, we need to listen to him. And what are we going to do? And he said, what do we need to do to make sure we get this changed? And I said, well, I just happen to have an amendment already written. I just need, and the, the, the education committee won't accept it. And he said, what is it? And I, so I read it to him and I said, this subsection does not require the program to include in its curriculum any concept, topic, or practice in conflict with the program's religious doctrines or to exclude from its curriculum any concept, topic, or practice consistent with the program's religious doctrines. I said, I'm trying to say we don't have to teach something we're opposed to, and we don't have to leave out anything we're in favor of. And he said, give me that language, and I'll write a letter to the... And he said, you'll get it today. And so they wrote a letter to the chairman of the education committee, and he put that right on the bill right away. So that gave me a, a lot of relief. But then those who were teaching their children at home or wanted to teach at home 
became very interested in the process as well. And some of them were teaching under the administrative rule that was in place that time. And a lot of them were teaching illegally according to the Department of Public Instruction. And I didn't know anybody that was teaching their children at home at that time. But they called me and some people called me and I said, well, we're not supposed to work on that at all because they're gonna do that with administrative code. And I said, I, we're just told to work on private school definition. So we finally on the ad hoc committee came up with a bill, Assembly Bill 887. And I'm gonna mention several things that happened along the way, but it was all the same bill. It's just that it got substitute amendment, which replaced it all or engrossed, and they took all the statutes, and I'll not try not to bore you with all the details because it gets kind of complicated, especially if you're not familiar with how the legislature works, or sometimes I say they don't work. But uh, anyway, um, they decided then, we kind of agreed and they decided to call a public hearing and get the public's input. So on January 25th of 1984, the public hearing was held in the assembly chambers. And I don't know, I was told that that was the biggest hearing that they ever had in the state capitol. But we had over 2,000 people that turned out for that hearing. It was, it was exciting. And uh, there were 1,600 people that either registered or testified in opposition to uh, the bill because it put the state superintendent or the local superintendent, it gave them the authority to approve a school before it could operate. And I wrestled with what to do because I, I said, I'm not going to go for that at all. Uh, we're not going to have that. And uh, so I testified at that hearing, and I testified for information only because I didn't want to oppose the bill because they'd done a lot of good things that I had gotten on there, and I wanted it to stay that way. I didn't want them to take those off. But I said then when I told them everything, I said, but I cannot support the bill in the current form. And so uh, that really set a fire going. And I was never so distraught in my life, I don't think, as I was the night I drove home from that hearing. I was crying and praying and driving down the road, and I said, Lord, you have got to help me. You've got to give me the the wording that I need. And I went home and I was exhausted. I crawled in bed and I woke up about three o'clock in the morning and my things were just running through my head so fast. I jumped out of bed, grabbed a paper and a pencil and started writing things down. I woke up the next morning and I, all I knew was that I had written something, but I had no idea what I wrote on that paper. And I got up and I read that paper and I said, thank you, Lord, because I, he gave me some ideas that I hadn't come up with. And so I called my, Wayne Wood was my sponsor in the assembly. I had met Wayne and uh, I called him and I said, Wayne, I just got a revolution, a revelation from the Lord last night. And I got, I got on paper what we need to do. And he said, well, come to my office and we'll do it. And so I went to his office, and that's where this whole thing got really started. And then I got a call from uh, Larry Caseman had called me, and we talked on more than one occasion. But Larry said, Marv, I don't have any input. The, the ad hoc committee won't listen to me. And I said, well, those meetings are open to the public. I said, you can come to the meeting and sit across the table from me, and if you don't like what they're doing, you can shake your head no, and I can vote against it. If you're okay with anything they're trying to do, you can nod, and I can vote for it. And so he did do that and come with that. And then he brought, I believe it was six couples, he brought to a meeting in Watertown. We met in the basement of a bank, and... Those six people refused to tell me their name because they thought I was a spy with the Department of Public Instruction. And I, I got up and I said, folks, look at me. Do I look like a spy? 
I said, Bert Grover and I almost despise each other. And I said, I'm not a spy with DPI, not far from it. But I had also had built a good relationship with Brian Rorty, who was the assistant state superintendent. And I found out later that he was kind of running the show for Bert. And uh, I said, let me prove it to you. So I, I got on the phone and I put it on speaker and I called Brian at his house. And I said, Brian, I have a group of parents out here that don't believe they have any input. I said, would you be willing to come and meet with them? And he said, yes, it'd take me about 45 minutes to get there. He said, I'll drive out to Watertown and meet with them. And I asked him, I said, are you ready to meet? They said, no, 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 we're not ready to meet because we don't know what we'd say. But I said, well, do you believe me now? And they said, yes. And I said, well, we had to get over that obstacle before I could really work with them. But then I told them, I said, well, if you'll work with me, I have the ability. I have, I'm on the committee and I have a vote and I have say for that. So I began to give these thoughts, and rewrite, and rewrite, and rewrite. And I sought a lot of advice from various groups. And I had several groups that were supporting my ideas. Uh, the Association of Christian Schools International and the Wisconsin Parents Association. I had encouraged uh, them to start a group. I said, you need to have a group. You can't just be individuals. You got to have a group of people. So they, they get scared of big numbers. And so Larry put together the Wisconsin Parents Association and the Wisconsin Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and the Education Committee of the United Pentecostal Church and, of course, the Wisconsin Association of Christian Schools, which I represented. But, and all the public school groups, they were in favor of the bill as it was before because they wanted to control. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. And you have to understand, the Democrats control both the Assembly and the Senate, and we had a Democrat governor at that time. And the Democrats, the legislature has changed so much, folks. Uh, there was a time, this was back in 84, early 84, there were Democrats that were pro-life and pro-family and didn't want to be interrupted by the government. But that all changed now, and... Uh, it's so much different. And if I were to try to get a bill passed today, it would not pass in Wisconsin because the Democrats would not support it, and I don't think the Republicans would support it either. We have a uniparty going on. I tell people the only two parties we have in Wisconsin is us against them, and that's it. But that's what's happened over the course of time. And so... I knew I had to have Democrat sponsors. And so I had met Wayne Wood already. I went into his office and he had an old Bible laying on his desk. It was, looked like it had been through every world war. And I said, I was very respective. I said, uh, Representative Wood, is, I said, is that your Bible? He said, yes, it is. I said, well, it looks well worn. He said, it gets a lot of use. And I said, I think you and I are on the same page. And I did get to preach in his church twice. and. Uh, the pastor's name was Lord, and uh, the second time I went there, he had called me, and he was going to be gone on vacation, wanted to know if I would come and fill the pulpit, and I said, yes. I got up to preach, and I said, the Lord's not here today, so I don't know how this is going to go, but <laughs> I'll give it my, my shot, So and it went well, but the first time I preached there, this little, little old lady came up to me, and I was standing by the pastor at the back of the church shaking hands, and this little old lady came up and took both of, my, both of her hands around my hand, and she said, young man, that's the best message I've ever heard in this church. You ought to be here every Sunday. And I'm standing right next to the pastor about fainting. But the Lord gives you a few things like that along the way to change anyway. But then we went into full lobby mode, and uh, the best lobbyist I had, I had about six or eight people. They were mostly women that would come, and we would, I would divide up the legislature. We would get in, I'd find a hearing room that was empty, and I would get in there, we would get in there, and I would block the door shut with a chair propped up against it so nobody could open it, and we would 
discuss what we're going to do that day and have prayer and then they would divide up and go and I would give them a different group and we went to every legislator's office every day that we met and we met many many times and the best lobbyist I had was a woman who in my idea she was about 11 months pregnant she could hardly walk but she was teaching her kids at home and she was teaching illegally but she walked like this because she could hardly walk and she would come into an office and they would say ma'am are you all right are you all right here sit down on this chair and so she would sit down and then she would tell them what she wanted and I told her I said you were a perfect lobbyist <laughs> but anyway that was what we did and then on March 1st of 1984 Assembly Bill 8887 was debated on the assembly floor for approximately five and a half hours. That thing went on and on and on. And there were a number of 21 amendments were attempted and several of them were adopted. And then there was one amendment, and if they would have passed this, we would have been in a lot better shape. I had personally went to these legislators and I had 18 co-sponsors on a bill that said that the Department of Public Instruction wasn't going to be over these private schools. And 18 co-sponsors, and when they took the vote that day on that amendment, five of the co-sponsors voted against it. I could have wrung their necks, but it taught me a real lesson because until legislators vote, you don't know what they're gonna do. They'll tell you anything that you wanna hear but they'll, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what they're going to do. And one of them, I tell this everywhere, one of them was Tommy Thompson, who was later a governor of Wisconsin. And uh, he was one of the co-sponsors, and he voted no on, the, on, on his own amendment. But so that, when they took that vote, that really changed things. And uh, then they passed the bill. And we, it got forward to the Senate. We went over to the Senate, and I knew I had, a, I had a lot of work to do over there. But I had to find a Senate sponsor. And so Wayne Wood took me up and introduced me to Senator Marvin Rochelle from Chippewa Falls. And I walked in, and Marv was wearing a Western suit and cowboy boots. And I was wearing a Western suit and cowboy boots. And we were both, our first names were Marvin. I said, you're the man. I said, you have got to be my sponsor in the Senate. He said, Marv, I don't know anything about education. I've never been on the education committee. I said, I'll do all the work for you. I just need somebody that's willing to stand up to Burt Grover, the state superintendent. He said, well, I'm not afraid of him. In fact, I don't like him. And I said, you're the man. And so he finally agreed to be my sponsor. And so, uh, and he also said that he would introduce a substitute amendment, which I had written, that removed the wording for mandatory approval and also added home-based private educational programs to the bill because I wanted, to, I wanted to get them on the same plane of private schools so that there was a basis there to work from. And uh, so March 27th, 1984, Marv Rochelle introduced that amendment and they voted to reject it and the vote lost on the rejection so that showed me that there were people there that, that liked what we were doing and uh, w then we had something to work with. And so then I had a state senator, uh, he was from Stoughton, Wisconsin, and he came to me and he said, I think that the state superintendent, if a school wants to be recognized, they should be able to get that. I said, they, no school would want that. He said, well, I, I'm not going to support it. And he said, I've got six senators on my side. So he said, if you don't put that in there, I'm going to oppose the bill. So <laughs> what we did then is we, uh, they moved the bill to the, end of the calendar to give me time and I went to the uh, drafter who I knew on a first name basis. I said, you gotta draft me this amendment. He said, no, I don't have time. I said, 
you got to do it now. Please, I beg you. And so finally he said, okay. And so he drafted this wording. He said, uh, an institution may request the state superintendent to approve the institution's educational program as a private school. The state superintendent shall base his or her approval solely on the criteria under sub one, which was all the requirements of the school. And so we came back with that and Senator Rochelle was, he said, Marv, I want you to stand right behind my chair on the floor. There was a pillar there. He said, stand right by that pillar. He said, because they're going to throw everything at us. And he said, I'm going to turn to you when they have an amendment. And if you shake your head, no, I'll oppose it. And if you shake your head, yes, I'll okay it. And so we started the debate on the floor and it got really heated. And the sergeant of arms came in and grabbed me and said, you have to get out of here. You're not allowed on the Senate floor. And I said, Marv Rochelle said I was to stand right behind you. And he said, I don't care what he said. I'm in charge. And he took me out. So then Marv came out and said, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, the sergeant of arms threw me out. And he grabbed the sergeant of arms by his coat. And he said, Marv Munyon is working for me. And I want him right behind me. And he said, OK, OK. So I stood behind him and threw that all. And <laughs> so we worked on that. And, and uh, Dr. Grover accused me of cheating. And Marv Rochelle said, what did he do to cheat? He said, well, he prayed to the God of heaven, and the God of heaven answered his prayer, and that's cheating. And Marv said, if that's the biggest sin that he ever, ever uh, does, he said, I think he'll be okay. <laughs> and Brian Rorty, the assistant superintendent, he accused me of praying that he, because he was in the hospital that day, was sick, and, and he accused me of praying that he would be in the hospital sick. I said, no, I would have never prayed that way. But I said, I did pray this way, and I'll tell you, I prayed that Lord would do whatever he needed to do to make sure that I got that amendment. And I said, if it was putting you in the hospital, that's, that's between you and the Lord to argue about. <laughs> so anyway, that's what happened. And they finally, the Senate then passed the bill on a voice vote, and they sent it back to the assembly. And we were kind of concerned because the state superintendent told me he had written a bill of his own, and they were going to introduce that. Well, I don't know what he wrote because it never did get introduced, but it went back to the assembly. And the next day, I got word uh, called, and I said, be here right away early because the assembly is going to vote on that bill. And it came up for vote, and they passed the Senate version 97 to 2. And the two people that voted against it came over and apologized to me later and said, we really messed up. And I said, I'll settle for 97 to 2 any day of the week. So, and so then that was, that was the passage of the bill. And then it went to the governor's office for his approval, for his to sign the bill. And I heard that the governor was thinking about vetoing the bill. So I went back to Marv Rochelle's office and I said, Marv, you got to do something because the governor's going to veto this bill. And he said, well, you sit over there in that chair and don't say a word. I'm going to put the speaker phone on and I'm going to call his office. And so Marv Rochelle called the office and the secretary said, she, she, he told him, I want to speak to governor right now. And she said, well, he's in a meeting. And Marv said, I don't care if he's meeting with the president of the United States. You tell him Senator Rochelle wants to talk to him right now. And the next voice we heard on the phone was the governor's voice. And he said, what do you need? And he said, I heard you're thinking about vetoing that education bill. And he said, yes, I am. And Marv said this, I'll never forget it in my lifetime. He said, if you veto that bill, I'll make your life so miserable, you'll wish your mother had aborted you as a baby. And then he hung up the phone. And I was sitting there just. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, what do you think the governor's going to do? I said, I don't know. But if I was the governor, I'd say, get that bill on my desk so I can sign it. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. And 
he signed the bill and uh, I have the pin that he signed it with. He signed it and gave the pin to Marv Rochelle and Marv turned around and gave it to me and said, you did all the work, you get to do that. But what we did then, what, what happened was we tied home-based private educational program with private school so that there was protection for everybody. And I'm telling you, they were so, I became public enemy number one. I got so many death threats, it was unreal. Uh, but I just wouldn't back down. And, and I had several of the lobbyists from the public school part that came to me and they said, Marv, if you ever teach a, a, a class on lobbying, we want to be your first recipients to be in that class. And we have never seen anything like this. And I said, well, the Lord did it all. And I, I just give it all to the Lord. And then uh, right away, the battle was over the reporting. You know, you have a form to fill out and the private schools had been filling that form out for years. And so we used that same form and Bert Grover, the first form that came out for home-based private educational programs, he wanted the social security number and the age of every child. So I got Marv Rochelle and Representative Wayne Wood. I said, you gotta go, we gotta go meet with the, with the governor or with the state superintendent. And we went over there and met in their office and he had a huge office with a huge board table in there. And Bert Grover sat across that table from me with his back towards me. He wouldn't even look at me. And I said to him, I said, I want you to follow the law to the letter. I don't want more and I don't want less. And I said, you're, you're saying that they want, you want the social security number and the age of each child. And I said, that's not in the law. And so he asked Brian Rorty, he was sitting by him, he said, is he right? And he said, yes, he is right. He said, then make him happy because I don't ever want to meet with him again. Well, then the second form came out and we had a meeting again because he had a different date to report the home-based private educational program students than the private schools. So we met again. But then the court cases started. And there was a little school, a little church, way up in northern Wisconsin, uh, almost to Superior, and they, the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, got after them because in the, in the uh, administrative code, if you have a school, you have to have a school well. And they didn't, it didn't matter if they had 500 people every day in church, that was okay, but they had 13 children in their Christian school. And so uh, a, a representative from the DNR went up there and she testified in court and I met with their attorney and uh, I filled him in on the details. And I'm telling you, it was, it was a circuit court there in Madison and I, I, I got really Baptocostal when, when the judge handed down his verdict. But she said that she went down in the basement and checked their well and it didn't check and so they shouldn't be able to have a school because they didn't have a school well. And the attorney got up and said, I'd like to have been there that day because the building is brand new and it's built on a concrete slab and doesn't have a basement. And the judge took both hands on his gavel and I thought he was going to break the gavel. He banged it on there and he leaned over his chair and he said, you get out of my court and don't you ever come back. And then a farm family were brought to court. And the judge was very calm that day and he said, because the DNR accused them of not having a school well. They had 500 cattle. And that was okay to water the cattle, but you couldn't, if you were going to teach in a school at your house, you had to have a school well. And the judge merely said, they don't have a school. They have a home-based private educational program. Case dismissed. So... It pays, and that's why I didn't want it to be called school because there's so much baggage comes when you put the word school on there. And so,
We've got to understand there was a lot of eager times, scary times, but I wouldn't give up and I don't want to give up again. But it's real limited to what we went through when you compare it to freedom. And I've had the privilege of being in Washington, D.C. so many times, and I walked through the Vietnam Memorial after dark, and they've got a big banner there that says, freedom is not free. And we've got to remember that, folks. We have to remember that. But the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And we're under threat as never before in our country and in our state. I could talk for hours on what's going on, but I won't, I don't have the time to do that. But we've got to realize, and last night when I got up at that meeting and saw all those people out there, I had no idea, no idea that what I did 40 years ago was going to have an impact like that on Wisconsin. And Jim Caviezel's what he said was so true. And Chris and I were going back to the room last night, and we were almost to our room, and Jim was out in the hall. And I got to stop him, and we talked to him for probably 15 minutes. That guy is suffering a lot of persecution. And he said it's going to be worse on the next movie that's coming out. And so... We need to pray for those kind of people. But Jim's a real hero in my book. But there are so many issues in education today. They got the LGBTQ and the CRT and the gender identity and uh, wanting boys and girls to use the same bathrooms and locker rooms. Even have <laughs> litter boxes for students that are acting as furriers, or furries. I, drag queen performances, library books that are so obnoxious that they can't be read in public at a, board, at a board meeting, but they're required reading for some students. That's what's going on in the schools today. And we need to understand what's going on. Governor Evers, used his veto power in this last budget and he crossed out letters and words and he came up with this. Every pupil now in the school districts, he is now permitted to raise their per pupil revenue by $325 annually for the next 402 years. Think about that. That affects everybody in this room your taxes. That's the kind of thing we have going on. And I'm out of time, so I, <laughs> I got to stop. But thank you for coming. And I pray that you will be ever vigilant. And who knows? Your children are the future of the state of Wisconsin and America. There's probably going to be some of your kids running for office one of these days. And I've met some young people that, boy, I've been praying that they get, they do that. So, Father, we thank you for this time, and we've been able to gather together. And, Lord, I pray that you would instill in each of our hearts the determination that we need to serve you and stand up against the dark days that may be ahead. And, Lord, I pray that as these young people are taught at home, that they will grow up to be citizens who respect liberty and freedom. And Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You've just been watching a presentation that Marv Munyon gave at the recent Christian Home Educators of Wisconsin Conference in Wisconsin Dells. 
and uh, giving the history of how this uh, homeschool law and the Freedom to Educate uh, Your Children Act came into fruition here in the state of Wisconsin. Randy, many, many people attended his workshop and benefited from this information that is nearly forgotten because we take for granted education in Wisconsin, but they fought hard to make this happen. They did. I even talked to Israel Wayne, and he mentioned that most people don't know the stories of the battles that were fought. What's amazing is that the same year that Marv was fighting, this was the year that HSLDA started. The battles and the fight that Marv did, the language that he had that protected the right, not just of parents to educate their children, but even of Christian schools to educate their children. That same language, later on, it made its way into the Missouri state laws and even into the Wyoming state laws. Other states looked to Wisconsin and said, how can we protect parents' control of education where we make sure that we will not, as a state, infringe mm -hmm. and that we can keep future generations from infringing on the religious nature of Christian education. So you've got a photo of this being signed into law on the, the day that this was enacted back in May of 1984. We do, and to think about that, that at this time, and what's neat is here it is in the picture, you'll see all the different legislators around, but Marv Bunyan is the one standing right behind the governor. And in fact, the pen that you see that he's offering to the other uh, state senator there, that state senator gave it to Marv, and uh, as you saw in the award ceremony, that was the pen. You know, a lot of times history gets uh, rewritten, but it's always neat when we can point, to, point out this was Marv. He was simply uh, the administrator of a small Christian day school. But he was one man, and he did something. Yeah, what a motivation for all of us. Randy, we have just a minute left here, but we, we just watched Marv Bunyan speak and kind of relive that battle and the process that, that got us here to this point is, as the parental control for education was really under attack at that particular time. But what does this battle look like for the future? Well, as we talked about kind of that idea of a, of a pinball machine where the ball can go many directions, Marv said, wait a minute, we are not going to let the government dictate what parental education looks like. Mm -hmm. That protected the freedom of education. Over the years nowadays where we are discussing school choice, the reason that we can have freedom where schools can participate in this is because Marv said seven years before school choice was even an idea in Wisconsin mm -hmm. that private education should be private, should not be government controlled. And that's why today across the country, school choice is benefiting almost a million students. But those schools are protected because Marv said back then that schools have rights. They are not just agents of the government. They need to be insulated from the government because of what one man did 40 years ago, mm -hmm. over a million students yeah. today are benefiting. But we must be forever vigilant on yes. this aspect. That's what, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Randy, thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. And friends, if you'd like more information about Christian home educating in Wisconsin, uh, you can go to uh, this website, homewi.school, homewi.school, and learn more information about the Christian home educators of Wisconsin. A historic year, 40 years now of this freedom here in the state of Wisconsin, thanks to Marv Munyon and other pioneers and warriors just like him who are engaged in the battle. A lesson for all of us. Thank you, friends, for joining us here on In Focus tonight and all this season here on WVCY Television. Have a good evening.